know, so when they do heart tra when they remove a heart for for a heart transplant, heart's still beating, but the brain is dead, like so. Okay, so brain dead is the, is the indicator of death in America, at least. Um, the second question, I just remind you. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, visual stimulation. Okay, yeah. So, so, yeah. So there's audio visual, audio visual, binaural stimulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of data, a lot of data, that if you uh, 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 rear animals in a stimulate environment of all kinds, auditory, visual, uh, uh, other things, you know, with, with toys and things like that, that their brains are very different than uh, they don't have that kind of stimulation. And that, that's been known for a long time. There's actually a group at Berkeley that started that back in the 70s, and, and it's continued. So, so all kinds of things change in the brain. Uh, the thickness of the brain changes in areas. The, the, the size of neurons can change in areas. The, um, the uh, uh, trophic factors release. So there, there's a whole the, the thousands of papers written on this. So the answer is yes. If you're if you're in a deprived environment with just monotonic stuff, you know, uh, your, your brain will will change in, in, a, in a way that that, that could be problematic long term. So big literature on that. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of your speech, you mentioned that uh, you know new machine learning is kind of different than the brain in a way that. Uh, one thing you mentioned was speed, so the speed of communication uh, for the speed of light and versus the brain, which is slower. Uh, what else do you think? Why do you, I mean, that seems to be no problem because then computers would be just better, right? They're faster than the human brain. But why do you think that there's there are problems in? But no, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's different. I didn't say it's a problem. I said the brain is not a computer. That that's not that's not how I put down the computers. Okay. Uh, I mean, there clearly computers can do things that a brain can't do, which is great, right? You want to, you want to find, uh, you know, you want to multiply uh, 9,745 by 6,033. I mean, maybe you guys can do that, but you know, my, my little iPhone can do that much better. So, it's, so it's not, a, it's not, it's not a put down of computers. It's just that the brain is not a computer. A lot of people think it is. People say, well, the brain works like a computer. It does not. It does not work like a computer. That, that was my point. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, my question is regarding the learning process. Do you show that the curve that uh, shows uh, the curve regarding the learning process? And my question is that uh, after your 20s, or like considering you are 20 year old, years old and you, you want to start a new, uh, a new career, let's say, for example, you want to start a physics. And uh, someone um, uh, 10 years uh, younger, let's say a teenager, uh, started doing physics, in, uh, started his career in physics, and his brain uh, uh, was, re was wired in this 10 years period, and what are the chances um, for you to succeed in the career? Uh, when you're older. When you're older. Yeah, and, and so, so I, it depends on, on, on what kind of career you're talking about, okay? If you're talking about something like going to physics, uh, I personally think that the, the data are, people, people will say this, you know, people will say that uh, if you look at uh, great physicists like Einstein and others, you know, they made their major contributions when they were in the early 20s and so on. But there's also, there's also a lot of data of, of People getting into the field much later and doing very well as, as well. So, so I think you know, I, I think that the evidence of saying, oh, you have to, you have to start, start it when you're, you know, 18 or 19 or 20, otherwise it's too late, is, is, is that's incorrect. You know, it, I, I think it kind of depends on what your proclivity is, to what day you want, how much time you want to put into it. You know, what happens a lot of times when you're, let's say, 35, okay. And you've got a family, and you've got kids, and you've got to worry about this, you've got to worry about that. That's a distraction to, to your thing. So it's comparing apples and oranges. When you're 18, you know, your parents are supporting you, or somebody's supporting you, you have nothing to worry about, you put all your time in physics. When you're 35, you have much less time to put in. Uh, let me just say one other point. This is a concern in the United States for the, uh, what kind of a, what your question raised uh, indirectly is this, that today, the average age at which a person in gets his, his or her first grant from NIH, that means you're now an independent investigator get your first grant today, it's 42 years old, 42 years old. 
At middle age, you get your first grant. Uh, and 20 years ago, it was 33. Okay. I got my first grant younger than that. But so what happens is, you know, there's real concern. You know, 42 years old, you just got your first grant, first, you know, to run the lab. So they're trying to, to change things to, to, to get people to be able to do it earlier. But I think, you know, if I understood your question correctly, uh, if you're if you're uh, 20 or you're 25, or you're 30, or you're 35, if you've got the passion for it, there's lots of examples in all different kinds of fields. The only the only the only uh, the only kind of endeavor with, where there is a big factor is sports. You know, if you want to be a uh, champion football player, you probably should start earlier than 35. <laughs> you know, uh, so so that would. I don't know if I answered your question, but do you want me to say something else? I was, I was initially thinking about programming, and um, I'm 20 years old, and I know a lot of my peers are, uh, want to change their majors, they are, they're not sure about their majors, and uh, my question was specifically about the brain. Um, will our brains be able, be able to wire? Like, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, I think, look, look I think I think what happens is uh, it's one thing to say, look, there are these kinds of changes, right? But I wouldn't make real life decisions on the basis of these changes, saying, okay, my wiring is set. Because the fact of the matter is, your wiring is changing in more subtle ways all the time, all the time. So your brain, every one of here, has been changed as a result of this lecture. May I say, for the better. So so that's just a fact of life. Okay. So, so I wouldn't worry about that kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, yeah, people will say, oh, look, your synapses are all, you know, number of synapses are all, but, but there's turnover in synapses. You have to get new synapses. The absolute number may not, may not change anymore, but some are forming, others are losing, and so on. So my advice to you would be, and this is a real challenge for everybody, find what you have a passion for. You know, what, what, when you wake up in the morning, you feel, wow, life is great, you know? I, I'm going to go work on this project or whatever it is and it makes you feel happy and content. That's what you should find. Everything else is is, is nonsense. You shouldn't you, you shouldn't worry about you know even even things people say well then, you know there, there may not be any jobs in physics. That's nonsense because you don't know what's going to happen in four or five years. Nobody knows. Plus you know plus the fact of the matter is especially if you feel this physics there are lots of people in the physics that are making multi-million dollars on Wall Street in America. So think about that. Lots and lots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, my question is somewhat resonating with the previous questions, and it is relating to the education, too. So uh, is there any kind of research that is showing evidence with uh, uh, between the uh, certain characteristics of the brain and the future career directions like uh, 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 selection of the uh, uh, specialty, uh, physics, teacher, carpenter, whatever it is. Yeah. I remember reading one book from science fiction that was about uh, a system that was actually doing that. And there was one guy that was uh, defining as he can do nothing. Right. But then it appeared to be then he was real jewel. He was real. Yeah. Think and uh, uh, it was not just talk. So this is the interesting. Yeah, part. I think it's interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a very good question, and, and the answer to your question is no. We we don't know, for example, or what you know. Or you, uh, no measure we have right now will say you should do this, you should do that, you should do this. And I think it'd be dangerous to try to say, okay, your brain should be carpenter because you can't do something. And and here's another thing, by the way, we don't know why, uh, for how. The brain of somebody that's a true genius, going back to physics, Einstein. How how is it different from normal brain? You know, you, you read this book, Einstein's brain. You know about Einstein's brain? Anybody know about this Einstein's brain? Nobody knows. You do? You know, she knows everything. Okay, so so here's an uh, here's an interesting little story, right? So Einstein acknowledged genius changed, you know, uh, the way we view the universe, the way you view everything, and and uh, uh, you know, nobody argues with that. So. Somehow, after he died, his brain was removed and it was kept for decades, for decades, in formalin, formalin is a fixative of the brain, in a bucket, in a, uh, in a um, pathologist's uh, laboratory 
someplace in the Midwest, Kansas City or somewhere. I'm, I forgot, there's a book about it, I forgot exactly how I got this interesting story. And there's a woman in Berkeley who's a neuroscientist called Marion Diamond, and she found, she found out about this. She was giving a lecture in, in the hospital in Kansas City, and somebody said, you know, that guy over there, he's got Einstein's brain in a bucket. <laughs> so she went and talked to him, and she got a piece of Einstein's brain, a little small piece that the guy cut for her. And she went to his lab, and she wanted to see, you know, what is it about his lab, or about his brain? So she stained it with different stains and published a paper. You can look it up, Marion Diamond, okay? And Einstein's brain, you Google it, you find this paper. And the paper claimed, well, she, she found this one area in the brain, that Einstein's brain had one difference from what she said was a quote-unquote normal brain, and that is that there's another cell type in the brain I didn't tell you about. Besides neurons, there's a cell type called glia, G-L-I-A. And there are actually many more glial cells in the brain than, than neurons. Glial cells have a complicated uh, relationship to neurons. There's a whole lecture on that and so on. Well, she said that Einstein's brain had more glial cells than, than, uh, than a normal brain. Now, you know, she published this in a not very good journal. Nobody really took it seriously. And, uh, you know, uh, it was done on a subject of one and so on. So there's no... E there's no reasoning to think that you could, using any methods we have right now, look at the brain of a real genius and say, boy, that's really different than normal. So uh, unfortunately, the answer to your question is something we don't have. Yeah. What about types of memory, like uh, visual memory or uh, verbal memory or numerical memory? Are yeah. there any kind of things? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, you know what, what people have studied, there are people who have these skills that they could remember 500 items and so on. And they've studied, they've studied their brains. One thing that has been shown, and this is, how many of you have been in London? Anybody been in London here? Okay. Anybody take a taxi in London? A few people. Okay. Taxis in London are the best in the world. Those guys, you know, the big bat like taxis, they have to take a two year uh, training, two years training, to, uh, to become a taxi driver in London. And they know everything. And what they what what was been shown is and this this in, in the journal Nature, which is a very good journal.